much anti-discrimination legislation is structured around an individual complaints model. The principle of equality before the law rests in a hybrid conception of civil and human rights, where the individual takes center stage. The function of rights is largely to protect individuals against interference from the state or possibly infringements by others. Redress is thus tied to evidence of a breach of their rights. There are four important characteristics to the individual complaints model. First, remedies for a violation are retrospective. Second, remedies will usually involve some form of monetary compensation. Third, the alleged victim bears the burden of proof. And fourth, courts evaluate the alleged infringement. This model we see thus constructs equality as a negative duty, meaning that people must refrain from infringing upon the rights of others. The most obvious advantage to the individual complaints model is the establishment of standards of treatment and behavior and an accompanying process through which people can be held accountable for violations of these standards. Whoever is bound by the legislation cannot act with impunity, for failure to comply with the relevant standards may trigger a complaint to be evaluated by the judiciary. In most jurisdictions, this has proven instrumental in eliminating many instances of direct discrimination and even certain instances of indirect discrimination. A complaints model also facilitates a form of institutional change by communicating to the public expectations of social behavior. In other words, a complaints model possesses important educative value. Unsurprisingly, there are also limitations to this model as well. As mentioned in an earlier lecture, the complaints model places great emphasis on individual rights and individual infringements. Individuals, whether women, ethnic or religious minorities, transsexuals, are discriminated against because of their group membership. While it may be easy to blame individuals, institutional arrangements will perpetuate patterns of disadvantage for these groups. Next, by focusing on restraint, meaning the duty to refrain from infringing on someone's rights, the state is imagined as a threat to liberty rather than a force for equality. Third, by demanding evidence of an individual breach, the collective and institutional character of most forms of discrimination is concealed. What we are left with is the deviancy of one misguided individual. Fourth, the litigation is dependent on both a breach and an individual confident enough to file a complaint and of course with sufficient resources to pursue the complaint. Without these, nothing happens. Finally, the individual complaints model places the burden on and places faith in the judiciary, absolving the legislative from actively promoting the equality principle. These limitations result in many shortcomings in the pursuit of equality. First, as alluded to, the individual complaints model places severe strain on alleged victims that gradually take its toll. Litigation is costly, both financially and emotionally. These impediments will often discourage people from pursuing claims. Second, by relying on victims, the courts only intervene randomly when the matter is brought before them. We can only speculate as to how many cases of discrimination never see the inside of a courtroom. Third, individual fault requires a proven perpetrator. But if much inequality is institutional, it can often prove difficult to identify fault with any single person. The same can be said of the remedy which provides monetary compensation to an individual rather than reforming the institutional conditions that produce the discrimination to begin with. Finally, litigation makes an adversarial relationship inevitable. Instead of approaching equality as a common goal, employers or public officials must necessarily defend against the discrimination claim. These concerns have precipitated a legislative response in the form of a proactive model. 
Proactive models seek to respond to the concerns raised about the complaints model by placing, by creating a statutory duty on public bodies or on employers to promote equality. They have been established in the UK via the Race Relations Act as amended in 2000 to promote equality of opportunity and good relations between people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. They have been established in Northern Ireland, where, via the Northern Ireland Act 1998, all public bodies have a duty to promote equality of opportunity between an array of groups, including men and women, people with and without disabilities, different religions, and more. What are some of the characteristics of a proactive model? First, the name itself, proactive model, highlights the shift in strategy. Rather than awaiting a complaint, employers and public officials are expected to take the initiative. It is prospective rather than retrospective. Second, the remedy becomes systemic rather than compensatory. We are trying to redress the system rather than compensating individuals for breaches. Third, individual blame becomes moot. There is recognition of the institutional character of discrimination. Fourth, proactive models eliminate the double victimization by relieving individuals of the burden of establishing a breach. Those in positions of power must pursue equality instead of defending against discrimination. Finally, proactive models are collectivist in character. They require not just employers and public officials to pursue policy, but also for publics to come together and decide the norms that matter. Stated otherwise, proactive models are more participatory than the individual complaints model as they reinforce the social character of both equality and inequality. Now, Before proceeding any further, let us consider what a proactive model looks like. In Northern Ireland, Fair Employment Legislation was enacted in 1998. It places a number of obligations on employers, including periodic reviews of the composition of their workforce, assessment of fair representation between Protestants and Catholics, positive action in the event the representation is unbalanced. It is important to identify the aim of a proactive measure, for it is easy to get caught up in the strategy. Too often, Lawmakers are satisfied with the monitoring aspect of the legislation, meaning the first part, periodic reviews, or the impact assessments when in fact it is the purpose to produce greater equality, or the third part, positive action in the event representation is unbalanced that is the focus of a proactive model. Of course, the devil is in the details, or in this case, the type of equality that is sought. Three models of equality are most prevalent equality of treatment, equality of opportunities, and equality of results. Unlike the complaints model, which targets equality of treatment, proactive models tend to gravitate between equality of opportunities and equality of results. In the case of the Northern Irish regulation, the aim is twofold. To create employment opportunities for members of each group and to achieve a measurable outcome, balance, proportionality in hiring practices and workplace representation. Canadian pay equity legislation, in contrast, aims to achieve equal pay for equal work of equal value between men and women, a clear equality of results strategy. Of course, both opportunities and results can and often are used interchangeably. The challenge is in the yardsticks used to measure success. Must the outcome be perfect proportionality of each group in the workforce? Or is it sufficient to ensure proportionality within educational systems that feed into the workforce? If the aim is perfect proportionality within the workforce, how do we account for merit in hiring practices? If the objective is proportionality within educational systems, how do we account for bias in hiring? practices. Moreover, in the case of pay equity legislation between men and women, it is common knowledge that compensation for work is tied to a variety of factors, including experience. 
Women are often precluded from obtaining similar opportunities for experience because of their overrepresentation in unpaid work, such as childcare and elder care. Without commensurate experience, differences in pay are easy to justify. Equity in pay then will require more than simply raising the salaries of women, but also the development of accommodations for child and elder care, flexible working, or opportunities for upskilling. The result of equal pay is dependent on equality of opportunity. Successful proactive models thus require much more than simply opportunities or results. They begin with an understanding of the cycle of disadvantage associated with historically disadvantaged groups. Next, it is critical that dignity play a central role in the development of these models to ensure that the stigma associated with membership in a disadvantaged group is also redressed. The dignity argument, while often glossed over, holds the key for the institutional change pursued in the third stage of the anti-discrimination timeline. What should be already observable is that proactive models are inherently collectivist in nature. The focus is taken away from the individual. They treat disadvantage as a collective experience and present redress as a collective responsibility. This is far different from the individual complaints model. Another distinguishing feature of proactive models is the element of participation. In the first instance, the aim is to increase the participation levels of marginalized groups within public institutions, within workplaces. In the second, the aim is to make policy more deliberative and thus more representative of the society as a whole, as it's not simply parliamentarians or judges who are deciding equality norms, rather it is the public as a whole. Transparency, by way of making documents public, is one way of facilitating participation. If the documents are widely available, it is easier for the public to become involved. They can do their homework. Accountability is another method, for it communicates to the public that their participation is expected to produce results. This requires participants in the way of empowered parliamentarians and an empowered public. Parliamentarians are expected to take on board the policy preferences as outlined, as communicated by the public, just as the public is expected to participate in the initiatives that are made available. Without either, the exercise becomes largely academic. Of course, participation on such a wide scale can become less representative of the aggrieved parties, minorities or marginalized groups, who are outnumbered by the majority. How to balance majority and minority interests is a key challenge for democratic societies in general, but is particularly acute when establishing a proactive model. Finally, in contrast to the individual complaints model, statutory duties do not create enforceable individual rights. Onus is placed on employers and public officials to bring about the sought after change and accountability comes via the way of reporting or the accountability measures that are established by the relevant authorities. While advantageous for the reasons mentioned earlier, proactive models also come with an important cost. Political action requires strong political support. The extent to which marginalized groups can maintain political interest in their cause has historically not proven particularly promising. Holding people to account for the failure to comply with the positive duties also runs the risk of entrenching an antagonistic relationship that proactive models were meant to escape. Embedding compliance with proactive measures is best achieved by specifying the precise duties that are expected. A problem is diagnosed and the solution is explained. Buy-in, while not guaranteed, is encouraged by making all the steps transparent, by making all the steps public. To conclude, the complaints model, with its direct forms of accountability, has proven effective in promoting equality. Shortcomings are readily observable, hence the legislative innovation we observe in the design of proactive models. 
proactive models seem to address many of the concerns of the complaints model. A positive assessment, however, should not blind us to the risks associated with it. Nor should proactive models spell the demise for the individual complaints model as litigation has, to repeat, often proven effective in holding people to account for prejudicial behavior. The direction we are headed in today seems to be one of balance. Whilst recognizing the need and value of an individual complaints model, societies are progressing by introducing proactive measures to facilitate the type of systemic change needed to produce more equal relations and more equal societies. Thank you.